Again, we're live with another episode of The Focal Thought. And today my guest is Randy Nickerson, who's a photographer that I actually met in Rotary Club. And um, Randy, I want to get right into this. Photography for me, I mean, it starts with, uh, with the camera. And I've always felt that with blink of an eye, with the click of a button, the camera can capture the whole frame of the universe. Like as much as information as it can process, you can capture, record, and store. So as a machine, it's, it's very fascinating uh, for me. Um, that's uh, my background in terms of the technology of the camera. You know, it's a philosophical sort of uh, background. So I'll leave it at that. And I want to segue straight into your, your, your photos, which you've aptly titled Street Photos. And um, I quickly want to go through some of them because I'm really fascinated by um, the way you've captured them. Really coming back to my analogy of, you know, capturing the universe in a single second, your photos have sort of captured events and moments. And the framework is unbelievable. You've got a lot of sort of emphasis on lighting. Um, you know, if we look at uh, a musician one that you've got on stage, you can actually see the spotlight and, you know, the smoke from the, the fog machine, etc. You can actually see lighting bouncing off the headstock of the guitar. So, I mean, that's your introduction, Randy. And mm -hmm. are you doing this on purpose or is it just coming out naturally yeah. for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot, uh, Gordon. Um, you know, I've been uh, taking pictures since I was about 17 years old and, Way back then, it all started with, um, you know, the old uh, Polaroids where you would take a picture and it would just zoom out the uh, the uh, sheet and it would just turn from nothing by magic into uh, a great photo. And I just love taking pictures of people. So that uh, developed over time to where um, I actually spent a lot of time growing up in Toronto, taking p pictures of people on the street. And I felt what was different about the, my approach was that uh, I wanted to get to know the people that I was taking pictures of. Uh, and when you know the people, you can actually um, capture their story a little bit better. And, um, you know, lots of people have trouble uh, going up and talking to people. Uh, I, I, there's a skill behind it. I mean, you, you look at people, you, you know, who's approachable, who's not approachable. Um, and, and I also didn't want to just make it about, uh, taking homeless people pictures because that's what a lot of people will do is they'll go out there with their long lens and they'll try to take shots of, uh, you know, people in distress and, and things like that. And I wanted to get away from that. I wanted to actually, uh, take pictures of people that were busking, for instance, on the street, or yeah. if somebody was street involved, you know, spend some time talking to them and try to grab a picture of them smiling, that sort of thing. So uh, that was the evolution for me till about uh, 10 years ago when I started working for Snap newspapers. And that again, got me to um, some events that were, you know, not always open to the general public, like a lot of concerts and sporting events. So it's a natural progression to go from street photography to taking pictures of events and, and people that um, in our community that are, are doing some great things. So that's how we get to today, where um, I, I do a little bit of everything now. I can see that, yeah. I mean, I'm just, you know, browsing through, you know, some of the pictures you've got on the website. And just, you know, within the, you know, the few that you've, you've put up there, they're contrasting by, you know, event type, like you've got sports, you've got music, you know, you've got different kinds of sports, different kinds of music. Um, you know, you've got um, boxing over there. Um, you know, you've got ice hockey, you've got ballet, you've got um, someone riding a bull. And I mean, the, the detail is incredible. Like if you look at um, the one you know, person riding the bull, you can actually see the specks of sand that the bull is kicking off. Um, I notice in your hockey pictures and 
and there's one with someone coming down a, a ski toboggan. You can see the snow, like just, you know, the bits of powder that are, are thrown up in the air. Do you Excellent. actually capture that detail or is this something you're just enhancing in post-production or that's awesome. Well, part of the, um, uh, the, the trick is to have some good equipment. And I was shooting, um, it occurred to me about oh, 15 years ago, I was shooting with some kit. Uh, lenses with my Nikon and I just lost too many really good photos because my gear wasn't good enough and, and, and specifically for the light conditions that I was shooting in. So I invested quite a bit of money into uh, getting some really good lenses and when you do that um, all of a sudden what's called dynamic range, this is the range that even our eyeballs see becomes available to you in your photography. So the depth, the, um, the, uh, the detail in, in a dark situation become um, all of a sudden achievable. And I don't know if you were looking through some of these, uh, the, the, bull, <laughs> the bull pictures were a lot of fun. Uh, you don't get to see a rodeo too, too many times. Yeah. And, um, and I used to have some, uh, people challenge me on the efficacy of, of shooting this kind of stuff. Whereas I tell them, well, you get to know that in, 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 in rodeo, for instance, that these are all skills that cowboys and cowgirls need to have to run a ranch. Um, oftentimes you have to bring back a calf that's, uh, you know, escaped the herd or uh, oftentimes you, if you want to, ride a horse they, they, that's a wild horse you have to learn how to 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 break them and so i i'm quite fine with um shooting that type of thing especially to be honest the animal has the upper hand on all of this stuff as you can yeah. tell by the uh what's happened to the people trying to ride them and getting uh getting the animal to pose is yeah is harder than <laughs> yeah. gear, of course yeah. but you need good gear um to to stop the action to that extent especially when possibly the uh, lighting isn't quite good enough for you um, actually one of my favorite shots uh is the wrestling there um they they had um uh, is that gold dust or yeah, there's gold dust in there. But if you go down to the black and whites, you'll see some Mexican wrestling uh, that were w was being put on at the Tribute Center. And that was an awful lot of fun to see. You know, it, it's all acting, right? It's all entertainment. Yeah. But, um, you know, these guys take quite a beating. Like, when you're up and close, you, you can see that one wrong move and somebody's going to be going home with an ambulance. Right. So <laughs> I can appreciate the athleticism of, uh, of that sport, but you know, uh, generally into, speaking, much I, into the bullfighting, right? I mean, it's the yeah, same sort of. exactly. But you know, I've been lucky Croydon in, uh, I don't know, should we call it a career that uh, I've been able to take pictures of the Harlem glow trotters of sting. Um, but not just of that, of, of people in our community doing really great things that you would never know about uh, had you, had I not been able to, to work with Snapped. Um, you know, the uh, Habitat for Humanity people, uh, the people of the Backdoor Mission. Uh, you know, been very fortunate to, to know people that I would nev never have met before. Correct. I mean, SNAPT is, you know, an organization that's well connected into the community, right? I mean, from dental offices to churches to restaurants, you name it, if it has to do with the community, SNAPT yeah. is on. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, I'm such a believer in their message. Um, you know, the, the other bonus working with SNAPT is that no one's really afraid of me and my camera when they know I'm from SNAPT. They know I'm there to highlight the good that they're doing and um again you can you can actually get quite emotional working with these people and it's the same um it's the same concept as when i used to do street photography is get to know them show them in their best light not their worst light 
And uh, whereas photojournalism and sometimes is, is to catch people doing the wrong thing, I'm really trying to catch people doing the good things that they're doing. Got it. And I mean, in, in reference to what you're saying of, of getting to know them, um, how, what's an example of say getting to know them versus just going out and taking the, the photo? How much okay. better would that make a photo? What sort of different take would it give you on the photo? Um, so uh, when I was downtown about five years ago, I was at City Hall in Toronto and there was a fellow riding a three-wheeled bike. Yeah. So he looked like maybe he was street involved, but you know, you got to be careful not to judge a book by its cover. So I, I stopped. I said, listen, you know, you look pretty cool on this bike and this is the project that I'm working on. I'm wondering if you'd like, uh, let me take your picture. And I said, like, just tell me a little bit about yourself. And he, he, he's just so surprised me. He was a, um, Oh my gosh, I'm going to blow it. But he was studying, uh, as a scientist, he yeah. had built the bike himself. So that was the key for me in that one particular situation was that I needed to show him being proud and being tall with his bike. So in those situations, when you want people to look powerful, you always shoot from below and it makes them bigger. And so I had him fold his arms, had his bike right there in the, in the, in the photograph and you know, it came out so well that, you know, I may have shot him at, uh, at eye level and maybe not really encompass the bike quite as much, but I took my time and I was able to, I think, capture him and what he's about more than if I had just clicked the photo. Got it. Yeah. So you kind of knew his background, um, where yes. he came from, and you translated that into the photo. And because don't forget, stylistic sort of yeah, power. Don't, don't forget a photo is is a story and if your viewer has to guess why you took the picture then you've you've missed the mark the viewer should always know without you telling them why you took that photo does it have to be their reason or it could be yours and they can try to relate to it. it it is my reason now you know if you're going to get into landscape photography and stuff like that uh, it can be everybody's reason, if you know what I mean. Everybody can take something different from that photo. Yeah. But when you're taking event photography and you're trying to take pictures of people, you know, it, it's important that the story is evident very quickly in, in, in that, uh, that photograph. And even in sports, to be honest with you, um, if you look at the Globetrotter pictures, um, each one of them, you know, the, the fellow with the hair is chasing the guy with the ball, you know, the, the, the trick, like, cause the glow trotters are, are a trickster team. So you'll see there's the one picture of the guy balancing the ball on his hand. I mean, I'm trying to portray not just basketball, but what, what's special about these, these folks, right? Correct. I mean, you've got a, another one with hockey, you know, down further at the page. And it's the, the puck sort of slowly, you know, bypassed the goalkeeper and it's getting into the net. And you've caught that moment. And you can see, you know, the expression on the goalie's face. And you can actually, you know, even though it's a, a still frame, you can see or get a sense of that puck animating into the, the net. It's really cool. Yeah. And, and again, you know, uh, to be honest, you take a lot of photos to come up with one. <laughs> now, you know, um, I tend to like, if I can come away with 10 photos at a, at a hockey game, I'm, I'm pretty happy, but I, I will take 300 pictures to get those 10. Those are the numbers, eh? 10 out of say 300 on average. Yeah. And, and uh, the old saying used to be, if you can get one good photo out of any thing that you you're going out to shoot, you've done well. I'm a little greedy. I like to get get 10. Why, why would you say that is? I mean, in the sense, cameras have come a long way today in terms of technology and, you know, more understanding about the, the science of the technology. You know, it would seem that maybe one could grasp the, the control mechanism much more, right, to, to get better shots. Or, or is it just are we dealing with light moving randomly? So capturing that and getting a good picture is, is challenging. Well, um, 
one of the things you do as you've gone along in this uh, journey is you push yourself and you, um, the, the, the theory is that you're already good enough with your gear. So now it's all about capturing those moments in, in, a, in a world where you don't know what the next moment is. Nice. So a lot of the times it's about getting lucky, but being in the right place to take advantage of the luck that you've been given. So that the phrase, you know, you make your own luck is very, very true when it comes to photography. You wow. know, photographers that get up early in the morning to go and catch the first light. Well, you don't know what the weather's going to be like. And, and there is some, some luck involved. But if you've done the work to go and get up early and go to the location that you want and have the gear ready and know your gear well enough that you can just spend time with your composition. Now you're talking. And, you know, I, I know a lot of uh, photographers that are nature photographers. I find taking pictures of humans uh, just another form of nature photography, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I mean, it's... Um... It's sort of like, you know, Peter Parker being Spider-Man. It's, it's the best tool for photographers, you know, to be able to be there at the moment to, to capture the first moment, right? A hundred percent. Put the work in. Uh, no, like I spend a lot of time researching. So I'll do a lot of sports that are not the norm. Um, for example, I, who would have known that there's an actual Quidditch tournament that is run out of the universities? So I know Harry Potter and Quidditch, but I didn't uh, really know about, um, uh, you know, what was involved. So I had to do some research on the game before I even went there. So um, that's, that's uh, the work you have to do, the pre-work that you have to do before you're, um, you're really ready to capture everything you want to capture. You got to know where to to go in different spaces. And, you know, I like to take pictures that might be different than everybody else's. Yes, and they are. You can tell off first glance that they are. Well, thank you. So you do you do a fair amount of homework, I mean, before going to the, the event? Is there maybe some research or, you know, thinking about it? Um, so research, uh, the, Google's my friend, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you can look up anything with Google, but even if you want to take baseball as an example, looking up some of the best photographers out there in, in the area you want to take pictures in is, um, uh, is, is the, some of the most important work you can do before you go. Yeah. Like I am a big fan of following a fellow named, uh, Richard Lawton's and now his dad, um, I think his name was Gary ran the Toronto star for a long time. And Richard is their best photographer. So he will shoot everything. He'll shoot, you know, mayors and premiers. Um, uh, but he's, he's been on the ice for the gold medal winning game for Canada and Sochi, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So I will try to take his photography and even try to use it at amateur sports events in in the Durham area just to see if I can you know make these kids look like stars right yeah no it's true if you have a professional picture I'd say an amateur event it, it makes the amateur event professional exactly and and you know that's a real if you can achieve that man like that's that's a cool part of taking photos like, I'll give you an example. If you're looking at, at the webpage, um, there's a picture of uh, a goalie getting a puck off his noodle. Um, and that's, uh, he was our athlete of the month. Uh, he plays for Clarington. Uh, and I mean, that's a picture that I would be happy to, get, like really happy to get at a pro sports event. Yeah. Um, that, that was shot through glass. I don't think you can tell the difference. Underneath him is the baseball player ready to throw the ball. If you look at his cheeks all puffed out, like he's getting prepared to, to throw it, it the story is all over that one. Yeah. Um, the girls basketball. If, if you notice, most of my photos are shooting up from the ground. It makes them very powerful. It makes them, you know, I, I think it puts a different, um, a different perspective on what they're doing. 
No, that's 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 really true. I'm, I'm looking at it here. Um, if you were to say now, you know, these are pictures that you're sort of trying to, you know, derive the intent out by yourself. You're making the decision and you're producing a, a photograph of it. But if you're collaborating with someone like, say, a journalist who's writing the article and you're maybe providing the, the photo, um, how would you work in that situation? Do you sort of, you know, speak with the, the writer and get a sense and, you know, come together on it? Or might you present the, the photo first and then the writer you know, does a take on it? Uh, generally like? speaking, when I go out, uh, there, there's a theme to whatever event you're going to. So I do do some work for the Oshawa Express and I did um, some work on the, uh, the, the police officers and the DeFonte Miller trial. And um, I knew there would be a lot of signage there and I knew my publisher wanted a feel of the event. And so I spent a lot of time looking for people holding signs, having messages. Like that, that shoot was all about messaging. Yeah. Um, if I'm shooting for Snap, then let's say, uh, for instance, today, P Premier um, Doug Ford was going around thanking lots of businesses in Durham um, to uh, to, to, that they switch gears and they started making like hand sanitizer or parts for ventilators. So it's really all about my, my goal with him was to see him actually touch the equipment that was made, uh, you know, to, to really send home the message that, uh, you know, and, and the writer's going to write about, you know, uh, let's say all for nothing, uh, brew house, uh, went from making beer to making uh, sanitizer for your hands. Yeah. So, you know, trying to get the photo to tell the story again, right? Yeah. Sort of maybe uh, re-impact or you know, the, the story. So the story hits the, the reader on the first level and then the, the picture will complement that as an impact, right? Exactly. Marrying the two. There's, yeah, I agree. Um, there, there, there's a quote here um, that I just wanted to pick up. It's by um, a travel photographer, Dario Andara. And it's just on Google. And they asked the question, uh, what makes a good photograph? And do you know Dario Andara? You know, that name sounds very familiar to me. And that question is often spoken by people in the photography community. <laughs> Okay, so here's Dario's response. I mean, I don't know him, but I just, you know, on research, I, I pulled this up. So, you know, he says on the question, what is a good photo? The most important element of a good photo is the ability of the photograph to communicate with the viewer. It should be able to tell a story through its composition, lighting, and most importantly, its subject matter. And this is great because, I mean, I was looking at this earlier, and this totally fits your style, of, you know, even what you've spoken too far in terms of the philosophy of photography, it really sinks in with what you've been saying. Yeah. Almost to a T, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. I mean, um, capturing moments. Okay. So if you've looked at the main page of my main uh, web, web page, you'll go to the bottom, you'll see a picture of vanilla ice singing and being ready for the ticker tape to come out at that moment in time just fits exactly what um, the statement you just read uh, said. It's the moment in time, it's the expression, it's the lighting. Nobody could say, that, there's nobody that would be able to say, oh, I don't know why Randy took that photo. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that's, that's the key of that. Uh, you do run into some trouble when it comes to inanimate objects like buildings. Like I, I do like to spend some time taking architecture photography. Nice. Um, so there it's more about a viewpoint, you know, but it's really about the lighting in those situations. So I guess what, I, what I'm trying to say, it really depends what kind of photographer you are. If you're a landscape photographer, it's all about the light. Um, in fact, I try to tell people that are learning, you know, see the light before you see the photo. Uh, the composition will come to you, but the light, being able to see the light before anything else is 
you know, here, here's an example. Let's say you're walking in a forest and you come across some leaves and the sun is shining through the leaf. All of a sudden, you've seen the light. It's not the leaf. It's the way the light treated the leaf. And now all of a sudden, it opens up a whole new world for your, your composition. Correct. It's almost like, you know, is the, the leaf the leaf or is the leaf the light, right? Like. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, light is 80% of what you're doing here. Less light, more light. Um, not enough light is definitely the wrong. <laughs> you know, that can really hurt your photography. And, you know, the, the correct light, right, in terms of relating to your intent of the yeah. photograph. And, and, you know, in today's world, that's where the software comes into play. You don't have to be bang on anymore. You can bring it into post-processing and um, use the tools like Lightroom, Photoshop, can really recover a lot of your light. And that's another thing I... Um, before I don't want to get too technical, but lots of people when they first start taking pictures, they'll turn their camera to auto mode and they'll shoot their photos in JPEG. And I try to get them to use manual mode and go to raw, uh, raw pictures. So here's the difference. In the old days with film, you were taking pictures. Today, you're capturing data. The more data you capture, the more you can do with it. JPEG, you can only capture like 296 bytes of information. With raw images, you can capture 4,075 bytes of information. Which one do you think you have the most latitude in recovering data? And that would be the raw photo, right? Got it. Yeah. I mean, it's more storage space, but it's well worth it because you've got more data to work with now if you need it. Exactly. Yeah, it's akin to a you know a musician trying to capture sound. You know, they want to capture as much of the raw sound as they want, and then you can play with it in post production, right? A hundred percent. Again, the closer you can get to what you want in cameras, the always the best. But it doesn't mean you, you're. You know, I've had a lot of photos recovered, and I mean, some of the software today, Croydon, is so amazing. Um, it. Uh, I don't know uh, the. Uh, automated intelligence of the software is is really recovering many many photos nice with with your photos how much of uh, post-production is there would you say compared to the actual you know raw raw photo um so i would say i can probably get through a photo in about you know a couple of minutes because okay. Again, I'm, I'm getting better at getting it right in the camera. Um, if, if there's uh, quite often what happens is your highlights get blown out or your shadows are too dark. So it's a matter of just moving a couple of sliders and it brings the detail back. And I, I would say I spend maybe two minutes a picture um, uh, getting, getting what I'm looking for. And once what you get one photo off and the rest of them are just, you know, copy the same process, you know? Correct. Yeah. And you know, with the, when I say post-production with your work, you know, I would say, you know, some people might use post-production to hide the original footage, but yours is just to bring out information from the original footage. You know, it's yeah, not cheesy CGI type graphics. It actually, well, exactly. Yeah. Which is great. And, and you have to be careful that my line is, you cannot, uh, photojournalism is almost right out of the camera. They only really allow you to play around with the contrast and the brightness and that sort of thing. You can't alter the photo in any way to change the story. So, you know, I've, I've learned over the last 10, 12 years, you know, um, I can crop in, I can remove items just by cropping in, but uh, you can't clone out items and that sort of thing. Have you ever tried uh, taking uh, photos of the stars, the night sky, constellations, things like that? Yeah. Um, my son is a great astronomer. He's got some great equipment. And he knows what where all the dark spots are out there. Uh, and there's one in uh, the Ganaraska Forest. Well, great. So yeah, we I actually we went to one about two weeks ago in Frontenac. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. First night. You know, um, uh, I, I tend to be um, 
fidgety. So you have to be patient when you're shooting astrophotography to get the Milky Way. You got to know the time of the year. You got to know what sky it's in. And sometimes for me, and I, I hate to admit this, um, I, I take three or four shots and I've, I've got the concept. Now I'm done. Let's move on to something else. Right. Yeah. So I found quickly that astrophotography, though fantastic and people that do it and really use the tools to bring out a, Andromeda's and in and, and some of the, the the galaxies is is fascinating. I I need stuff that's moving a little bit quicker, you know. Got it. And it, is it is it hard to do? Because I mean, you're dealing with limited yeah. light, being you know the light yeah. of the stars. And no, it, it's very kind hard. Of just too many times, I think. Right? Yeah, it's very hard to do because oftentimes uh, you're going to a sky that cloudy now you're going home you know you're going out at 11 o'clock at night or three o'clock in the morning because that's when the milky way is in the right hemisphere for you um and then uh, there's some scientific rules to use like you're allowed to shoot if you shoot anything longer than 30 seconds to let enough light in you start getting star trails you know the the earth's always moving so you start to realize how fast it's moving when you try to take pictures of the star, try taking a picture of a moon. And let's say you have a 30 second um, picture. Well, that moon has moved right through your viewfinder. So you do learn, learn a lot about um, the, the universe when you're, you get into that. And yeah. it is very difficult. I, I bow to people that can get those awesome comet shots or any of those things. I'm just thinking with your post-production on those type of photos, it would be amazing to see. <laughs> yeah. Well, you do have to spend some time on – everybody has to spend time on post-production because there's always a lot of grain um, with those kinds of photos. And to bring out the gas and those sorts of things, you have to play at it for quite a while. Got it, yeah. And, you know, I just remember the, the astronomer being there and the telescope was set up and you couldn't move the telescope, right? Because just the, the slightest move took your, your picture out of the, the view. Exactly. You know, think about it like when you build a house. If you're off on your foundation by an inch, you're off at the roof line by a foot. <laughs> it's the same thing with astrophotography. Well, you know, with... Um what Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are doing in terms of space travel, you know, photographers eventually will be headed into space to cover hockey games that are playing in space. So maybe we'll see you there at some point. <laughs> well, for sure. These people have big dreams and I wouldn't uh, ever speculate that they won't come true for them. I'm okay on earth though for now, buddy. <laughs> we'll be closer to capture the stars. <laughs> yeah. Listen, Randy, thanks so much Jeff, for doing this. I hope you didn't mind. I wanted to jump different categories in terms of questioning because you're an awesome photographer and I wanted to pull it out in terms of, you know, technically, philosophically uh, from the conversation. So thanks. You've, you know, you've been great and it's been a great conversation today. Well, listen, I really appreciate the really kind words. Trust me, there's an awful lot of great photographers out there people that I look up to because you, you always have to have somebody that you aspire to. Uh, to to try to be as good as their work. So, and uh, now, I, you know, we're at a point that I really like to teach people. I really like to spend time talking photography and thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to speak photography. No, that's great. And I mean, if, if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way on social media or your website? Uh, just my email, uh, randy at streetphotos.ca. Um, and anybody's welcome to reach out to me to ask me a question or, um, any, any help I can give them would be uh, not a problem for me. Okay, that's great. And I'll put that up in the, the show notes as well for people when they want to connect. Thanks, Graydon. Okay, thanks again, Randy, for being on the episode. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Take care. Have a great evening.